Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight to celebrate the release of Vesper Flights in paperback with authors Helen McDonald and Amy nizuka Til. I'm Maggie, the Marketing and Events Manager here at Flyleaf. Before we begin, if you have questions during the event, please put them in the chat or in the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of the screen, and I'll ask them towards the end of the evening. You can find out about all our virtual events by clicking on the link at the top of the screen. If you'd like to make a donation to Flyleaf Books to help us continue to bring great programs like this one to you in the future, please click the Donate button below our faces. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and tonight's authors, we have copies of Helen's book, Best for Flights, and Amy's book, World of Wonders, available for purchase. Just click the Buy button beneath our faces. You can also call Flyleaf to order over the phone, or if you're local to Chapel Hill, come visit us and shop our shelves. We're now open seven days a week. And now I'd like to welcome our authors for tonight's event. Helen McDonald is a writer, poet, naturalist, and historian of science. Her book, Ages for Hawk, won many prizes, including the Samuel Johnson Prize for Nonfiction, the Costa Book of the Year, the Prix de Milieu Livre Étranger in France, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Curtis Prize for Nonfiction. She is a frequent contributor to the New York Times Magazine and lives in Suffolk, England. Amy nizuka is the multi-award winning author of the New York Times best-selling World of Wonders, an illustrated essay collection, as well as a four books of poetry, including Oceanic. Her writing appears in Poetry, the New York Times Magazine, ESPN, and Ten House. She serves as poetry faculty for the writing workshops in Greece and is professor of English and creative writing in the University of Mississippi's MFA program. I'm going to minimize myself now so that we can focus on the authors, but I'll pop back up in a little over 30 minutes to moderate those great questions that our captive audience members will be posting in the Q&A. Hi. Hi, Helen. It's so Hello. nice to meet you. And um, I'm so, I'm trying not to fangirl here, but Me too. Uh, I'm so, stop, stop. Um, I, I know we're going to have such a good time here tonight. I know, though, that uh, people will be dying to hear your voice. So why don't we do that? We'll do, we'll, um, uh, I'm going to shut down my screen for a little bit and I can't wait to, to add this. So this will be my first time to hear you. I, I feel like I've heard you in my head um, for many years, but um, I, I can't wait to, to come on back um, and, uh, and pepper you with questions and, and chatting. So um, I'll see you in a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, this is great, it's lovely to, thank you, I wish I could be, you know, with you all in person, but I'm getting used to this uh, virtual event thing, and um, usually, uh, this is great, because it's a nighttime event, you can't see how unclean my kitchen is, I'm quite pleased that it's kind of dark behind me, you know, it's, you can't see that everything needs wiping down and polishing. So, um, I'm going to read a little bit from um, the book, Vesper Flights, as you know, a collection of essays, and uh, the bird on the front is a swift, um, it's a kind of like a, a very special bird to me, and it kind of, its flight courses through the pages of the book too, as you can see from the very long wings and hardly, you can't see any visible feet, it's a very aerial creature, um, they live in the sky a little bit like um, fish inhabit the ocean. You know, they, they, they can't even walk. They can't land. If they land, they get stuck. They need to be flying and they can kind of cling to buildings and things. But um, when the young birds leave the nest, they fly continually for two to three years without touching anything. This weird solitary life uh, without any physical contact. It kind of blows my mind a bit. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit about a friend of mine called Judith who very sadly passed away this, this week. Um, she'd been very unwell and her specialty is rearing orphaned swifts. And um, she puts them in these little uh, plastic containers of like, uh, like pet carriers on paper towels and she feeds them and eventually it's time to release them because they're ready to go. So I'm gonna read, it's a long introduction, but I'm gonna read this bit here. What you do is you, you put the bird on your outstretched palm and you hold your hand out in a wide flat area facing into the wind and then you just have to wait um, to see what happens. In the bright air, the swift looks a weird unearthly creature, a delicate construction of scalloped feathers and ungainly wings. Hunched into itself, its miniature claws grip my fingers, its deep eyes like reflective astronaut visors. I wonder what it can see lines of magnetic force perhaps, rising air and flying insects and the suspicion of summer storms. The flat green beneath it has nothing to do with it at all. I lift my hand higher. All I can do now is wait. 
It stares into the wind for a while, then starts shivering. Anticipation, I think. Functional explanations. This bird is warming up its pectoral muscles ready for flight. Emotional explanations. Anticipation, wonder, joy, terror. The sensitive plumes growing between the feathers of its wings and sleek sides are being brushed by the breeze, feeling their element for the first time. And nothing has visibly changed, but something is happening, like an aircraft avionics system coming online as it powers up. Blinking lights, engine check, check. But that doesn't work though, not quite as an analogy, because what I'm watching is a new thing making itself out of something else. There is no doubt in my mind that this is as much a transformation as a dragonfly larva crawling from water and tearing itself out into a thing with wings. On my open palm, a creature whose home has been paper towels and plastic boxes is turning into a different creature whose home is thousands of miles of air. Then the swift decides. It tilts the pug sharp tiny tip of its beak upwards arches its back and drops from my flattened palm, making an aching series of stiff and creaky wing beats. For five or six seconds, everything feels wrong. The bird is a mere foot above the grass and my heart is beating fast. Up, 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 calls Judith. Nothing is broken. We are just watching a bird learning to fly. Hitching as if pulling into gear, the swift starts to ascend, flickering up and up into an evening sky streaked with cirrus. It describes one careful circle above our heads, then lifts even higher and straight lines it to the south. I look down at my palm. There's a little scratch on the meat of my thumb where its claws had gripped, gripped tight before letting me go to the hand that was the last solid thing the bird would touch for years. It was a very emotional moment. It was very emotional. And Amy is back. She is reappearing. There she is. Thank you for letting me just witch her on there. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't leave you hanging. Although I could honestly, I was sitting here just wrapped, just, you know, um, listening again and again. It's like having the very best of an audio book just right here. Um, I love that passage that you read. And and selfishly, um, you know, I was, I was going through this morning thinking, oh, if I had some session, I won't do this to you. But I was, I, I wanted to convey it to you that, um, when I was reading, I love the Vesper section for sure, um, but the chapter on the eclipse, I thought was just on a sentence level, so beautiful and something that I um, just really needed. It's kind of a funny thing to say, but really needed during the pandemic. It's it's funny, I'm sure you hear this all the time, you know, um, both of us released books in 2020 and who would have known would have been happening mm -hmm. um, during this time. But I've been so moved to hear um, people say that um, my my essays were any sort of a companion during this horrific moment. I wanted to tell you that Eclipse was that for me. Um, there's so many in this book, but Eclipse in particular. And I wanted to see, um, gosh, I, there's so many ways I can start. So I'll just, I'll just kind of just plunge right in. Um, right. I always say that nature for me is like the, the greatest poet ever. I'm just taking notes, you know, for poetry, you know. And I know you, yeah, it seems like nature for you is just, um, and I don't know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to make you flinch or anything, but I feel like with your, um, with all these essays nestled up against each other, it's, it seems like not just a poet, but uh, nature is a teacher for, not just for you, for everybody. Yeah. Um, what is some ways, this is kind of a big, just kind of general question, and then we can narrow it down. What are some ways in particular during the pandemic that you found yourself saying, oh gosh, I wish if I was writing this now, if I was writing this chapter now during the pandemic, I would have added this, you know? So I'm curious. Right. Yeah. Not to know what you learned about nature when you were writing it, but what do you learn about nature now, mm -hmm. one year plus into the pandemic? It's a really beautiful question. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as you know, obviously, you know, um, 
nature has been kind of recast it's been a sort of theme of running through a lot of the sort of talk about you know how to cope with lockdown how to deal with the pandemic this notion that nature is a source of solace you know and mm -hmm. one of the things that i got very ratty and grumpy about early on was this constant refrain that we you know to to it's safe for us to go out into the woods and fields and you know sort yeah. of commune with the natural world and you know that's safe and, and i'm just thinking you know what well, it's it's also a spectacular bit of privilege assumption there you know i mean not everyone gets to be out gets to those places there's a lot of people living in you know crowded inner cities with limited financial resources so i thought a lot about um during the pandemic about how to encounter the natural world on a very limited small scale and it actually fitted really closely with some of the things i was already writing about mm -hmm. And those are about what the philosopher um, Iris Murdoch called unselfing. Um, mm -hmm. This notion that by concentrating very hard on an animal, it can be a bug, you know, it hasn't got to be, you know, something huge or impressive. Um, and trying to understand what it might be like to be inside that animal, sort of radical empathy. When you pull yourself back into yourself after that, you have lessened the press of whatever preoccupations and anxieties that you're feeling as a person. So that's a really interesting movement. And I push it a bit forward to talk a bit more about how if you do that, you also have to start thinking about what the animal's world is like, how it's different from yours and what the animal needs. So there's a kind of a sort of sense right through this book of, of a kind of need for empathy, um, of a need to try and see through other eyes, of a desperate plea to love diversity and difference. Um, so that, that those things I think for me have been heightened by the pandemic. Yeah. Um, in terms of what I would write different, the weird thing is that some of these pieces seem to me now weirdly, um, they seem to be about the pandemic. Yeah. The title essay, Vesper Flights, as you know, is about um, the importance of expertise, the importance of looking out onto the horizon to see yeah. what's coming next to try and, if you can, not everyone has the time to do this because they're busy uh, living and surviving, but if you can, if you have the luxury of being able to try and work to see what's coming next yeah. um, and that was i think when i wrote it was probably about climate change but now i read this last section about swifts looking over the horizon and seeing dark clouds coming and i'm like oh my god you know the the, the, the whole retroactively being rewritten as a, as a thing about the pandemic but the pandemic too i mean i don't know about you but i mean certainly i don't know if you've heard from readers who said like you know that their concentration spans have been shot because oh, of yes and they've been kind of really thankful that these pieces are really short. So, I know. You know. Absolutely. It's been, um, yeah, and I, I'm speaking for myself. My concentration is absolutely um, yeah. shut. I mean, it's really, so even, um, and it was already short before because I'm, I'm, I'm trained as a poet. I, I really like the brevity to begin with. So that even just, you know, um, condensed even more uh, because I was, you know, one eye is always on the news. Like what's mm -hmm. going on next? I mean, yeah. I'm from the American South where we have the Delta variant yeah. spreading like wildfire, you know, yeah. It's, yeah, it's um, for everybody in the audience, I hate to be, you know, um, gloom and doom, but, uh, I can't stress this enough. It is so contagious. Um, and, and in fact, I was just, in fact, last week, I, today was my day I came out of isolation and I was like, I am not gonna miss, um, how, you know, I'm talking with Helen. Uh, unbeknownst to me, last week, uh, a little more than last week, um, I sat next to a dear friend who I haven't seen in over a year. He did not, he was vaccinated. This was outdoors unbeknownst to him the day before we were sitting together he had contracted covid yeah so i mean and, and he's vaccinated it's so, really contagious yeah i know i have two people i know that this happened to both were sitting outside yeah with people um you know mark they weren't wearing masks because but, but but they thought you know with the airflow they'd be fine it is just is 60 percent more contagious i mean it really is scary so yes people yes i know this is your call from the writers. It's scary. So. I know. I've tried to be like nice and kind about it, but I'm, I'm, I, I don't like having um, a little concentration. I like to be able to. I don't like wearing masks. You know that kind of thing. I was isolated from my family for ten days, um, and I'm. Well, I'm glad you're out. I'm glad you're okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, I would. I would have been like coming from my masked um, you know, situation. I wanted to 
poetry thing's really interesting. So, you know, I started as a poet. I mean, that was my, you know, my thing, these bizarre constructions that I made when I was a doofus, miserable undergraduate when I started writing poetry. And back then, I mean, they felt, um, they were they were very, you know, experimental. Um, and what they were trying to do was kind of play with the cadences of lyric poetry and then sort of stuff them full of kind of language that really shouldn't be there. They were kind of like abstract expressions and they were kind of quite playful like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't written poetry for a long time, but one thing that it has left me with is this notion that um, when I would start writing a poem, it was always a puzzle that I was trying to solve. It was a, a journey from one end to the next, and it would sort of snap shut and leave me happy that it was locking me out at the end. I knew it was finished because it would like be that's enough, you know. And I really was really surprised writing the essays to feel how much like poetry writing they were. That that there was that sense that when I, you know, most of these essays, when I started writing, I, you know, very bad at planning. I just honestly follow the sentence down the page and try and work out whatever puzzle the essay is kind of presenting me with. Mm -hmm. And it's a really fascinating thing to do an essay. I'm, I'm kind of in love with them now. I mean, I, I was a bit, you know, I was a bit, I was the world's worst student at school. I never finished my essays. I was like the worst. Yeah. So it's been like a real joy for me to play with this form. And I'm really pleased that um, I have. What do you think, just to follow up on that, what do you think is it about the sentence or following kind of a question that you might start with that you are so good at in an essay um, that maybe the, a poem doesn't offer you? What, what do you think about the sentence as opposed to the line? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna use a terrible metaphor because you know, writers, so like a, a poem seems to me like a, like a very complicated mechanism. It's like you could hardly breathe on it or it'll, it'll break like a watch or something. Like you're, you've got a little and you're kind of dropping bits in, cogs in, and you're kind of like, <laughs> um, I think there's a lot more robustness to an essay. And, and often with an essay, I've, there's much more of an implied reader for me. So the, the, the essays for me are like, um, I follow the sentence in terms of these kind of rolling sentences and I have to listen very carefully, like, like writing a poem or like writing any prose really as well. You have to listen to where it wants to take you. Mm -hmm. But there's always a sense that I'm standing next to, next to the reader I'm writing to and that we are walking together. Again, that's a very woolly sort of, you know, sentimental thing to say, but they feel like conversations, even as if, if there's no one actually answering, answering oh, about absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I think it's so palpable here. I mean, I felt like, um a friend was chatting with me about all oh, the, all the astonishing things that um this world traveler has 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 seen and was curious about and to me that's the greatest kind of company to keep someone who's curious about the planet and thus other people you know besides themselves so that leads me to my next question in terms of how did you negotiate that curiosity for uh, plants and animals and natural occurrences like an, an eclipse with putting the eye in there. How much of Helen, like, so was there anything where you were like, oh, I'm putting too much Helen in here or things where you're saying like, I want to step out of this and just narrate, you know, how did you negotiate that? It's something that I always, um, I always, I, I, I don't have an answer myself. So selfishly, I always want to hear from other people. How did you negotiate how much of yourself to put in yeah. about the other uh, about about other living creatures and and plants. Um, yeah, I mean, there's two two really important things I think about that, and one is the um, the inclusion of myself in these essays. It's a, it's a, it's programmatic, right? I do it on purpose, and it's basically just reflexivity. It's the old anthropologist trick, right? I mean, I, you know, I don't want to take my cue from that, but there's no there's there's a lot of nature writing, as you know, which is basically the voice of God, right? It tends to be uh elite white guys wandering around pointing at things and explaining them to you and i love those books right i grew up on them it's a voice that it's very easy to fall into you know it's the expert voice and um but those voices always carry assumptions with them that are never really often unpacked and so basically i i want to put myself in the book because if you get to know me as a person yeah. then you as a reader can read what I write and think well yeah you would think that wouldn't you I mean you know, it's like I can see where you're coming from and it gives the reader more power which is really important to me yeah the other thing is I I've, I've always feel with these essays that you know 
there was a time a while ago when I went out and I, I, I was doing the whole wandering around and I found these mushrooms and I'm like, oh, I want to write about this. And I, I came back and I discovered myself trying to identify them. I got all the books out. You know, I wanted to basically put these things in my essay <laughs> and explain to everyone, I, you know, what they were. And I suddenly realized this was dishonest mm. that you know, there is a lot of mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes and I'm very ignorant about many things in this book. And I think that also I try and I think about that as a form of honesty, but also generosity because nature is one of those places. There are so many, there's so much kind of a, a sense that you need to be an expert to, to, to go out into it. There's a kind of gatekeeping thing there. And I think that's really unhelpful. So those are the two real, the, the two kind of programmatic things in terms of putting myself in. And also I try and laugh at myself. I mean, I'm just wandering around getting covered in mud and rained on and, you know, I'm a bit of an idiot a lot of the time. And, you know, I quite like the comic relief that I can be in an essay. Sure, <laughs> sure. And, then, you know, it, Helen, that's been one of the most delightful things about your writing is that, you know, I too grew up with, I mean, Thoreau was held up as the the American environmentalist and I won't knock Thoreau, but... There was oh, you totally can. I'm, I'm really cool with that. <laughs> No, but I, I guess I'm just saying it was, it was hard for me as an Asian American growing up in the 80s to feel like that there was a place for me outdoors um, because of, there was a lot of weird gatekeeping and I'm not a scientist. I love science. I love reading about it. I love being outside. But what I loved about your book is that there's a um, vulnerability and a humility that I just, I, I hope this is kind of a new wave of nature writing. Like to not say I have all the answers, but more, I have a lot of questions come along with me as I try to figure this out. And I may not ever have the answer, but I'm gonna show you my process, you know, that kind of, and be covered in mind. Definitely try and do that. And it's really great to hear that that that, that that's something that you, you picked up on. And, and also just like, as you know, what, what's another thing the book tries to do all the time you know, possibly to excess, I'm not sure, but it's to try and kind of, again, um, try and investigate and reveal the social uh, assumptions that we're, we're, we're putting in the natural world. You know, I, I always talk about it like um, that line from Baudelaire about the devil that the, mm -hmm. usual, the usual suspects stole, mm -hmm. one about how, you know, the, the greatest trick the devil ever played was con convincing us he didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always think of that with nature because we, you know, we, we're the, you know, the sort of script, the cultural script is that it doesn't have any human meanings. It's the one place that's free of them. And it's where we put all the, the darkest, deepest, you know, strongest ones, the things we want to prove are natural. So yeah, there's a lot of class in this book uh, in particular because of Britain and, uh, you know, I, I just think nature is infinitely various and so are the practices that we use to relate to it. Mm -hmm. And we've just been limiting ourselves in terms of the kinds of ways we write about those, those things. So I try and kind of Bring all that out and i you know grump about posh people who are allowed to keep ducks but poor people aren't allowed to keep finches you know it, the, the kind of hypocrisies that we all deal yeah. with every day but so they're all in there too there's a bit of academic stuff in there pushed in as well sure sure but i i so appreciate as as a reader and as a professor how much you how open i feel like uh with with the kind of the most jovial field guide who I who I want to have a cocktail with and also you know tromp around in the mud and rain and and um and mountains with you know as well so I to me I think that in spite that I think is the key to inspiring the next generation of nature writers to say hey maybe I've got something to say too and you know um Helen didn't have all the answers she was not a scientist spouting Latin left and right you know and and also she has feelings <laughs> and they're in this group. I mean, that was something growing up, the nature writing that I read seemed to be devoid of feeling, a like human yeah. emotion, you know what I mean? And really I, interesting. Yeah, that's, sorry, I'm butting in, but it's, I, I'm really interested in this because, you know, I've, I did a, a, some work a long while back looking at the history of um, um, amateur nature organizations in Britain. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a bit of a weird academic at heart. And I look at the history of this bird organization called the Royal Society of the Protection of Birds. Oh, it's really yeah. interesting. It started off as a, as a campaigning organization, mainly women, um, against the, oh, the special forces helicopters have started. That's a usual thing. Oh, no. yeah, there's an American air base really close, so there's a bit of America hovering around. Sorry. So it started off as a, um, mainly women, mm -hmm. and 
it was quite sentimental. It was all about saving the birds. There was a lot of talk about, you know, the, the, the baby birds were being, you know, orphaned. And it was very much about sort of feeding birds and loving birds. Mm. And there was a kind of slow takeover by what was, um, that made it into a much more authoritative mm. organization. And it was basically taken over by guys and they were all scientists and, and they sort of very carefully stripped away that all those ways of talking about birds mm. and the natural world that were considered to be womanly. Mm. No more sentimentality, no more emotion. It was all about, you know, behavior. It was all about whatever. And that kind of scientization of how you're allowed to relate to the natural world, I think there's a really interesting gendered history there that isn't really talked about. It's really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just, it's really, it's, it's definitely a subject that's near and dear to my heart because uh, it goes back to that question of gatekeeping of who gets to write um, about the outside world and who doesn't, and why is that happening in 2021? It's not 1951, you know that kind of thing. And and um, what I love about yours is that um, so many things I um, so many things I, I I thought this would be and it, and it has been is it is this. This appeals to the, you know, the tweed wearing elbow patch um, person who, who's kind of a know-it-all and the person who's like, I have been curious, but I can't, I, I can't really be bothered. I just want to, I just want to read a book, you know, that kind of thing. I, ha I, have, I can't be bothered to go outside. So and I think it's so difficult to do, to catch both of those audiences. Usually you catch one or the other, but not both. I wondered if you can talk just um, the nuts and bolts, if we can back up just a little, little bit and talk about like how you came up with this project in the first place. Cause I know there's so many Helen McDonald fans in the, in the audience, but there might be some who, who don't know how the origins of this book happened. Was it, were you purposely making your own wonder comer to collect, Oh, I know I want to do kind of this cabinet of curiosities in a book or has it, or did it come about more organically? You know, that kind of thing. Just can you talk about the origins of this? Because this is not a straight up memoir. These are individual yeah. essays. And I love that it's like a beautiful necklace. They're each bead of a chapter is so beautiful, but when strung together, that's, and you know, to use a, a ridiculous yeah. metaphor, when strung all together, they really speak to each other, they complete each other but each one of them can stand on its own like this just beautiful little bead so can you talk about just putting this together and how did you know i'm guessing if it's anything um like the essays i know there was probably essays that were yeah there was an essay about star wars that didn't go in i was like i mean I, looking back on it it really didn't fit at all i don't know what was i thinking it was about nostalgia and about star wars and about about aging, um, and I was quite, I'm not grumpy, but I was kind of a bit sad in going, but actually now looking at it, it's, it wasn't that good actually. So I feel like I, I, I that was. Um, but, I, I, there's a Venn diagram of Helen McDonald fans and Star Wars fans that would love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe it'll appear one day somewhere else, but um, so yeah, it was a really interesting thing to do. So uh, after Ages for Hawk came out, um, I had the great honor of being invited to write a, 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 a column for the New York Times Magazine yes. on nature. And I did a, a bunch of those, often under quite hilarious circumstances. Mm -hmm. Quite often I was on tour and I was kind of crying in hotel rooms at 4 a.m. trying to get meet deadlines. Um, you know, writing about kind of, you know, wild, I remember the, uh, writing of that wild boar essay oh. I finished in a hotel room in Jaipur. Oh my God. It was amazing. It was a great place, but I was kind of like, this is so weird. Like, what am I going to write about an English forest? It's so funny. Can you, just as a, as a curiosity, I do remember when you're, when you're doing that, you're still doing that column, aren't you? Or is it? No, no, no I, I write, I still write for the magazine. I write features now. Yeah. Yeah. And it, is it, um, did you have, were you, because I remember coming across it, having my little croissant and coffee. Was it every month or was it every, every month? Yeah, it was every month. Yeah, I think every week would have killed me. I, I, I'm not as productive as as, as many other amazing uh, other as, as other people. Um, you had deadlines. Did you already think, aha, I'm going to make these into a wonder camera? And also, can you for the audience, can you say what a wonder camera is for people? Yes, a uh, wonder camera. It's a great. Uh, so I used to be a historian of science, and it's a, a, a wonder camera is a, a wonderful. It's a German phrase, a cabinet of wonders or a cabinet of curiosities, and it was this um, sort of 16th century craze that spread through the kind of the great houses and halls of Europe. And basically what it was, was a cabinet or a bunch of shelves really mm. full of just interesting stuff, right? Mm. So 
um, like a bit like a museum cabinet, only private. Um, but what's great about them is that nothing was behind glass. You were supposed to sort of pick these things up and look at them and compare them and feel their weight and look at them with each other. Um, and they weren't arranged according to the classifications of museums today. So you would have, you know, sort of artifacts from different cultures, little icons, feathers, you know, bones, you know, dried fish, you know, jewelry, like it all kind of in one place. And the point was to have these marvelous things to marvel at and to look at and compare. And I just thought, this is what I want my book to be. That's so so a, lot of, a lot of those essays the, the, that were originally in the magazine were rewritten a little bit for this book. Um, so they went in there and other essays for other places that I'd written sort of for various magazines as well, that, because, you know, they were a lot about, were about nature. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot in here that were written just for the book. And some of the, th some of the essays are very small, some are very sort of meant to be funny. Um, and then some, some of them, the, the bigger essays were proper, like real, um, I was sort of sent by the New York Times magazine out to the Andes to go out into the high desert with a bunch of space scientists. You know, I wouldn't be doing that on my own. So I really am thankful for those kind of commissions because they let me write about subjects that, you know, and there's an essay about, um, I interviewed a refugee to Britain. Yes. Uh, and that was a charity, um, you know, uh, campaigning to close down some of the detention centers, mm -hmm. that were really un inhumane. Um, so there's a lot of stuff together. So, um, but a lot were written for the book, a lot were written for friends. A lot of them were kind of puzzles that I, something, interested me and I wanted to work out what like why why am I not interested in deer why do they bore me senseless <laughs> you know that was a puzzle I wanted to solve so um and I wanted to do a book of essays for lots of reasons and I guess one of the reasons to be blunt is that I just knew that I couldn't follow H's for Hawk with a book that was like it you know that's yeah. there's not gonna be another one like that book mm -hmm. um I mean my next one is going to be also big non-fiction with memoir but um I had to just do something different yeah, yeah. and um and as for arranging them, I, you know, I'd love to say that it was all carefully planned, but, you know, I had all these essays and, you know, two years ago, my mum broke her hip and it was Christmas time and she was staying, um, recovering, and I had a dear friend come to stay and it was all like, we're trying to get this book done. And my friend Christina, who's in the book, mm -hmm. finally snapped and said, right, let's just do this now. Just print them all out. So I printed them all out. I got this big table. We just put them all out on the table and spent like, you know, two hours just swearing and I was like smoking. <laughs> You know, going out with cigarettes and swearing when we put them in this order um, and there is kind of a you know mm -hmm. uh, an order to it oh i love that i love that there's so much mm -hmm. um companionship throughout this book and it's and i was and to hear that there was companionship even in the shaping of it as well yeah. well this is this is what i mean this is what happened with the essays you know so the um new york times is that you know there's a huge difference i don't know how many people watching know this between the way that uh, writing for British newspapers and magazines works and the way that it works in the United States. So in Britain, if you write an article for somewhere, you send it off and then you don't hear anything back for like, you know, ever. And then suddenly it will appear in the in the newspaper, but you know, maybe the most important bit will have been taken out. So it makes no <laughs> sense at all. And of course, you know, that was the tradition I was used to. So I would send these things off to the New York Times magazine. I had the most astonishing genius editor, Sasha, it's just astonishing. And there'd be this to and fro with suggestions and thoughts <laughs> and notes. And initially I panicked. I was like, I must be the worst writer in the world. <laughs> so that was really interesting. And it taught me about community and about collaboration in a really rich way. So I'm, I'm that I feel is one of the great ways in which, you know, I, I was sort of moved towards this book was this sense of not only the pages being filled with people as well as, well as creatures, but also the book itself in, in a sense is mm -hmm. it comes conversations oh i love that yeah there's nothing like a good editor to make you you know and and i have a um it's a not, not even a fraught relationship but i you know i had the same inclination like oh gosh why why is she asking so many questions or why you know it's yeah, like, it was right it's just annoying it's yeah, it's simply anyway yeah um, and it's and it's just the exact questions that i needed to ask myself you know uh, that kind of thing so um i wondered um what? <laughs> what is the hardest part? This is kind of like um, you know, for people who are who are, who are nature writers in the audience or who love nature writing, you know, for you, what is the hardest part about? What is the biggest? I don't want to say hardest. What is the the biggest challenge about writing about animals in particular? Um, and then what's the most? 
what's the most surprising delight in writing about animals? Is it something like, are you a person who says, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want to anthropomorphize, or are you just like, I'm gonna anthropomorphize, who cares? You know, this is me writing and I'm tired of following the same old, same old situation. Like what is, yeah. what are some challenges and what are the surprises and the delights for you? Um, the challenge uh, of writing about animals. I, th I think one of the challenges for me is trying to strike a balance between, because what, you know, one of the, when well, again, another one of the things in the book I, I go on about uh, uh, quite a lot is that, you know, we, we so often assume that s sort of science subtracts beauty and mystery from the yeah. world. So to really get a kind of, you know, astonishing encounter with an animal, you know, you don't, it's, it's not a scientific encounter, it's a sentimental mm -hmm. or an emotional one. Mm -hmm. And I, I do talk about how, you know, that, that, that actually, you know, it's only because I know some of the sciences that what I know what I'm seeing and that's what makes it an occasion of absolute sublimity and wonder. I wouldn't know what I was seeing if I hadn't read the, the papers, yes. scientific papers. So there is a sense, I think, with the difficulty there was to try and both um, weave together my own emotional and experiential stuff with the science and with a and with the kind of the reality of this of an animal and you know animals you know I said but just now we you know we we fill them full of our meaning but you know you if you can look if you know those meanings and you can kind of look past them and you can see these yeah. these alien creatures you know I just kind of you know I don't know I sort of it's really poignant there's all this kind of like oh let's go to space you know and, and you know aliens and it's just like we are surrounded by other minds, you know, that, that are not us. So like, I, I just don't understand the notion that to explore one needs to go out to where there's literally is no life. There's nothing that we know of. I mean, why? But there you go, that's just a thing. Um, and in terms of surprise and delight, um, I don't know, I, I there, there is a lot of talk in an, animal study circles of there's a kind of joke about how you know people's lives change when they stare into the eyes of an elephant mm -hmm. or something like that, right? That moment of recognition across a species boundary, mm -hmm. and I, I'm really interested in that one. That's that's always a really because I, I think of that. There's an uh, the famous Annie Dillard essay on the weasel, which oh, is, yes, yes. It's a very interesting one for me because I read it. You know, basically what happens is she wanders around and then she sees this weasel and looks at her and. They just have this moment where she says, you know, I'm not anthropomorphizing here, you know. Yeah. For 60 seconds, I was inside that weasel's brain and he was inside mine. And I'm like, absolutely hot damn. That is exactly what it's like. Mm -hmm. but then she talks about how what it's like to be a weasel, and it's basically like the wolf of Wall Street meets Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about the indomitable will and like grasping mm -hmm. hold of what you need and don't let go. And I'm like, okay, I, I can't go that far, right? It's mm -hmm. so clear to me that's a projection. Yeah. Um, with so, her, her own baggage and what, what she yeah, yeah. And, stuff and like I that. love that essay, but I think it's also quite scary, right? And um, animals are always more than we, we mm -hmm. think they are. Mm -hmm. So I think that recognizing that looking at an animal is always this weird dual moment where you're both looking at a real creature that is nothing like you as an alien, but there's somehow a, something that passes between you. Mm -hmm. And then also recognizing what you're bringing to the table those moments are absolutely thrilling. They're so complicated and they happen in an instant. So I'm, I really love those. Mm -hmm. And you can't, yeah, I think you, they're so unpredictable. You can't say, oh, yeah. well, today I'm going to write about ants and I'm going to make a connection. <laughs> no, you can't. And, and you know, I am, I have, you know, I'm an ADHD person. I have no attention span at all. And one of the reasons I think I love the natural world is that it is this weird combination of, uh, you know, you know what you're going to see when you go out to particular places you've been before in a kind of gross sense. You know what plants yes. are going to be there. You know what animals are kind of going to be there. But the fine granular detail of what you see is always different. It's yeah. never boring. And uh, th again, that that but the sort of veering between those two, I also find really thrilling. Yeah. It's home, home. It's familiar and unfamiliar always at the same time. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny, like that. Like again, I keep mentioning ants, but in that ants essay you mentioned like you know that going to um um you know you talk about uh the Mar the mars essay and then but i i like reading the ants almost companion pieces because here you were going to, i think is it the supermarket you were running errands and you witnessed the mating flying of the dan of these ants and um the you know flying ants and oh, there's that moment of too like i i know 
nobody thinks, oh, I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to encounter an animal that's going to be in my book. You know, that, that kind no, of that thing. was, yeah, it happens, Don. I mean, you know, it was one of those moments where, you know, I'm glad no one else is in the car because I kind of screeched to a halt. I'm, I'm, you know, it could have probably been rear ended by some other car. But yeah, keeping your eyes open and for. And there's an essay towards the end of the book where I talk a little bit about, I guess, I guess the divine, you know, I don't come from a religious background. I don't, I don't have faith as such. And, um, but this notion of always being open to signs and wonders is very important to me. And that's what the ants were, you know, I, I, I saw this, um, sort of wheeling flock of gulls behaving very oddly and they were kind of jerking in the air and I couldn't see the ants so they were tiny but I knew exactly what was going on and it was all these tiny rising hopes of these ants you know these female ants you know they 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 born with wings and they well they hatch with wings and then so do these male ants and then they basically the females fly and fly and fly up and then the males chase them and then they mate in midair and then the males fall to earth and die because they're not mm -hmm. or, you know and then the females, you know, they have these mating flights. And then once they've mated, you know, they only mate once or twice, you know, up there. And they might live 30 years laying eggs that are fertile after that. So, like, you know, that one afternoon in a humid sky, being attacked by gulls all around. Yeah, yeah. It's the birth of tiny empires. I mean, how can that not be something that, you know, just blows one away? So, yeah, that was amazing. But I did nearly crash my car. <laughs> It is, I mean, yeah, I, uh, I, this is coming from a person who is almost like driven off the road just from looking at a shade of purple that I just, yeah, I, yeah, I know, right? Right. Being a writer is it's very, I don't know, they should probably up our insurance and make you know, <laughs> That's why I'm paying a high premium. Yeah. Well, I know we have questions from the audience, but I want to ask one more um, before we turn it in. And anybody else? Yeah, I'm seeing here drop in. Um, you yeah. know, um, yeah, so um, I think, you know, um, I learned about, oops, oops, sorry, oh. where, was, was I gone? Oh, okay. there. Can you, I, it's okay, I can still hear you, keep talking. Okay, can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, we have a storm, we're in like tornado season here, so um, anyway. Uh, the question I have for you is that term solastalgia. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right, solastalgia? I always see it and then I never say it out loud. Um, but you mentioned in the beginning of the book that your subject, that you hope you always write about love in some way, you know. How do you balance that? Um, I feel like my, so I, I have solastalgia all the time, but I feel like it's heightened now that I've been indoors so much because of the pandemic. How do you feel? Um, I know you said there's not one without the other. You can't write about love without grief in general. Do you feel like soulstalgia in particular is something that we'll ever not have anymore? Or is this something like, I I'm just curious, like, is this, is this something yeah, that's- I think, I think it's with us now. I mean, you know, we, as you know, that can, the last, we're in a state now with the stalled, you know, the jet stream stalled. We're in a state where these sort of, epically catastrophic events are going yeah. to be happening and um you know california now again in direct terrible drought mm -hmm. so nostalgia if anyone's you know listening yes. to what it is it's a it's a term coined by an australian philosopher called glenn albrecht and it's it basically is um nostalgia for a place that you're already in mm -hmm. right he coined it uh, about the australian droughts and how people who you know grew up in these houses surrounded by lush pasture and forests you know, the pasture and forests died and they're in the same place, but they're surrounded by desert. And I think that's, you know, solastalgia is something we, we're going to have to deal with. And, you know, I always think of Aldo Leopold's phrase, you know, very prescient phrase that, you know, the penalties of an ecological education is that, you know, you, you live alone in a world of wounds and we're all getting to that point now. You know, I think the familiar shifts away. I and mean, we, we're used to losing things. We're used to losing, you know, the the, the the brands that we used to eat and love as a kid, right? We're used to things disappearing, but that's fast capitalism. That's not the same, right? Yeah, so no. I think, yeah, I mean, trying to maintain hope in this time of real terror is very difficult, but we have to, we have to try because if we don't, we'll do absolutely nothing, either because we're too optimistic or because we're too pessimistic. Yeah, so yeah. we just have yeah. to get and raise our voices um, and change the system. Yeah, it's very scary. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of um, I, I saw. Well, thanks, thanks Mark. Magic. Sorry, Mark's just put down the uh, a much better 
Oh, good. there you go. Nostalgia. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's good. Thank you, Mark. Um, that reminds me of uh, Margaret Atwood. Uh, thanks to the magic of Zoom, I heard her um, speak, and she said, you know, the future, when someone asks, how can you have hope? You know, what? what's the point of having hope? You know, everything, we're doomed. And she said, and just very wise in her, in her very wise way, um, the future is not written yet. The future has not yet been written. And it, it just, I, I kind of love that. It's like, yeah, it's just, it just goes with what you said. Like, mm -hmm. we have, yes, we can have soul nostalgia and also we can have hope um and and write about the things that, that we love you know um while they're still here you know that. yeah and, and i think you know a lot of nature writers i mean there's been a huge renaissance of nature writing in britain over the last sort of decade and you know it is the case that most of those writers are either my age or a little older mm. and um you know the the scale of environmental collapse in europe in my lifetime has been terrifying you know mm. and um i for a long time i think i sort of just generally quietly unthinkingly believed that massive biodiversity loss was as much an inevitable part of getting older as getting gray hair but <laughs> yeah. no, you know it's not yeah. we have to fight against that intuition oh hello mm -hmm. hi hello um, i'm back to ask some questions from the audience if that's okay with y'all yeah okay um i'm going to start with a question from bob who asked how do swifts sleep or rest Going back to your earlier discussion, your reading. Very, very cool. Something buzzing. Thank you. There's a very big, loud buzzing noise. Thank you. Um, it's a very cool question. So, um, so most birds, basically, birds are just cooler than us. You know, they've, they've they've got more efficient respiratory systems. They've got you know blood cells with nuclei that can hold. I mean, they're just they're just really cool. <laughs> basically, it's they can see more colors than we can, and they can fly. And basically they, they have this ability with their, um, when they sleep, they have this thing called unihemispheric sleep. So they can literally, they close this eye and they put this hemisphere of their brain into sleep, into REM sleep, and then they can swap, right? Which means that they can sleep when they fly, which is how a lot of migrating birds manage to cover such great distances. And you might've seen that actually quite often. If you see ducks loafing around by a river in the sun, you'll see that some of them have their one eye shut and that's just because they're putting the other side of it. They're sleeping over here and not here because predators, right? They've got to keep an eye open. So there is that kind of sleep. And that means that swifts can, can fly and keep an eye on what's going on and on each other and still rest. But they do speculate that swifts actually do sleep properly up there, along with some other birds like frigate birds. They've done some weird work with like kind of loggers and things. And they think that they maybe there may be very short periods where these birds actually shut down into total like deep sleep. And um, they may coast on the wind. They may fly in circles. We don't know. It's it's like the bottom of the ocean up there. You know, it's 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 a very mysterious place. And but I talk about this um, this extraordinary thing that happened in in the first world war that this 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 uh french aviator cut his engines and gliding down over enemy lines to take photographs you know and he he flew through this party of swifts in deep sleep just hanging under the moonlight you know and he actually managed to catch some and bring them back down i don't know how i just have i would love to imagine he just sort of reached out but um so yeah they they, they do sleep up there it's, it's a really haunting image that the moonlight and the airplane and the clouds and the swifts and the sleep. I loved in that in the essay High Rise when you talk about the levels of birds and they're kind of looking up in the projection that just blew my mind. I, I had to read that aloud to friends because I just couldn't even comprehend it. It was amazing. High um, Rise, sorry, I'm going to just say High Rise was amazing. I mean that really did teach me that um, I thought the sky was this blank empty place but actually it's completely full of life. Less than there once was but but a lot of life up there and it's a whole ecosystem up there it's always moving it was really thrilling now i look up and i'm like oh it's you know it's like looking into the sea sorry please continue <laughs> i'm so excited about these things we like to hear you talk about it so you can you can go off on a tangent anytime you want it's it's wonderful um we have a comment in the question box that i'm going to read aloud now um that says again from bob the brilliance for me of H is for Hawk is the constant interplay between human life, pain, and difficulties, and the similar aspects of those of these aspects in the life of animals you are living very close to. So that was a comment from Bob. Yeah, yeah, that that book was a a very interesting one to write because 
you know, we talked a bit about how much of oneself to put in a book, right, earlier, I mean, which is really, really cool sort of thing to think about. And when I started writing Ages for Hawk, I, I was very British about it. I thought everyone would just want to hear about the bird um, and a little bit about the writer T.H. White. It was mainly going to be about this hawk. And it just didn't work. I just kept trying to write and it was like running into a brick wall over and over again. I got very despondent. And then I had this like a little epiphany one day when I realized that I wasn't being honest and I needed to put down as truthfully as I could remember how I felt. Uh, and as soon as I started doing that, the book began to flow and it made me write about the hawk differently too. Um, it made me feel you know, it was written for memory. It was a long time before, but I think grief does weird things to memory. So I remembered it very clearly, but I remember opening myself up to my own emotions when I and putting them down made me feel a lot more kind of compassionate and close to the bird as well. And I think I wrote about Mabel differently because of that. So yeah, the pain and the loss and the grief and the projection and all those things kind of got traded between the two of us and and um, not just in the projections and psychological things, but also in the writing. Uh, it was very important that, that there were three characters in that book. There was T.H. White, Mabel and me. I was a character, you know, so it's a really good comment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. I have another question here. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Oh, from Bob. He, you don't need to respond, but he had lost his wife of 50 years when he had read the book. So it was very affecting for him, I think. I'm so sorry. I'm so very sorry. I'm very, very sorry. I, um, I don't know. I, I, uh, one of the things about touring with that book was I had not expected to meet so many astonishing you know, people with stories of, of recent losses and old losses of magnitude and, and, and sadness. You know, I lost my dad, you know, I loved him, but there were losses I heard of that were almost unimaginable to me. And um, it was a very, very weird feeling to just, I think I grew up then. I think I was a bit of a child until that point. I, I think I didn't realize that we all go through these terrible, tearing losses of people that had very dear to us to the point that they are us they're part of us and um, so yeah that that was that was astonishing and, and um astonishing and not not in a patronizing sense i mean deep a deep astonishment about the strangeness of our existence that we're just here for a very short time and you know the the love between people is as strong as it's like adamantine right it's like diamonds but and it survives people disappearing but people disappear all the time and it's just you know, my friend Judith, you know, I, I had tea with her two weeks ago. We had a laugh, you know, and it's not going to happen again. It's it's bewildering and horrifying and, and and utterly natural and it's bizarre. I'm so sorry, Bob. I'm really sorry. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Meredith uh, for you both. She says she loved the part of the conversation about creating alternative to traditional Thoreau-esque na nature writing. For both Amy and Helen, what else excites you about contemporary nature writing? What do you want to see more of? Do you want to actually go first? Do you want to go? First? I don't mind. Go, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Um, I do recommend anyone who's not going to get angry with me about this, I recommend you read a wonderful essay on Thoreau that's in, in the New Yorker archive. It's probably online. It's by um, the great writer Catherine Schultz, and it's such a takedown. It's amazing. Um, she's so sort of, you know, basically sort of says, you know, he just wasn't, yeah, he wasn't all that. It's it's worth reading. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's a fascinating essay. Um, just more voices, right? I mean, you know, I, I'm really pleased that there is a situation now where, you know, that's not just uh, white blokes anymore, but we need more. You know, as I said, nature's a various place. So are the things that bring us to it, so are the ways in which we interact with it. And to honor it, you know, and to honor everyone, we need we need to kind of write the balance. So, you know, if you haven't read, for example, The Home Place by J. Drew Lanham, you should read that, mm -hmm. astonishing. We need more. Um, we need more colors from. We need sorry. We need more voices from um, people of color, from black writers, from trans writers, from women. We just need everyone. You know, these these are spaces that which we talked about before, Amy. These are spaces that were very carefully policed to keep out anyone who wasn't didn't fit the right landownery kind of. You know, there's a lot of power caught up in how we are, are allowed to access nature. So yeah, we need more voices and we need them urgently. And I'm so pleased that they're out there. Slowly, 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just co-sign everything that um, that Helen said. And you know, there's a, um, in addition to Drew Lanham, who I adore as well, um, and is my press mate, um, there's Dara uh, McAnulty, mm -hmm. um, who just released his uh, his book. Um, he um, is, I want to say 17 now, um, but he is this, you know, uh, amazing, just gorgeous writer, and he has autism. So when Helen calls for just uh, a diversity of voices, that's different sexualities, different abilities, different, um, just different viewpoints, so that I think the next generation can see, oh, there's a place in the outdoors for me, because there's a direct, there's actually a direct horrifying result of what happens when we are not exposed to diverse voices outside, and what happens is is um, people who are not white, straight males um, get policed over on, on belonging outside. So um, people who are bird watching, who may have darker skin, might be you know have the police called on them, and that is a life threatening situation. Uh, people get asked, well, "What are you doing, or why are you here?" When they're in, on their property, you know, that kind of thing. So the more we can normalize uh, diversity of all backgrounds in the outside, mm -hmm. uh, it actually has some actual life or death consequences for people, you know, so, um, yeah. And it's also, I, I'm fond of saying it's 2021, not 1951 anymore, you know, like why would we be reading the same kinds of voices um from all that time ago um you know and and anyway it's just it's um yeah it, there's some life that it's not just oh do this um for the sake of doing it there's l l real life consequences when people are um when people certain when certain people are made to feel like they don't belong and they can get killed over it that's a problem that we could solve by what books we choose to publish, what books we choose to buy with our own money, um, and what, what that signals to publishers with um, uh, with the power of the dollar bill, honestly, you know. Um, and also, we have responsibility to the next generation to show that people can be outside no matter what your background is. And also, I want to say the location, too, because I think, Helen, you mentioned this earlier, um, nature is everywhere. It's not just in a a prairie or a you know in a in a forest you know it is in downtown manhattan it is um in in um uh underneath a car you know there are yeah. there are birds um making nests there you know that kind of thing so i think mm -hmm. whatever we can do to normalize that nature is around us and to let have more people have access to nature the, yeah. the better for everybody yeah, because of course, you know, it's 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 a it, we are told a lot all the time, and for a very good reason that it's something that's precious and to be protected. But sometimes I feel, and again, I say this in the book, that it, it sometimes feels it's behind plate glass and we're not allowed to touch it. Yeah, yeah. And if we don't touch it, we don't care about it. If we don't care about it, it's gonna, you know, we, it's just gonna fade. So I also think that um, encouraging you know, younger people to just get out there and be messy and play if that if there's, you know, or to, you know, turn over rocks in the park or whatever and look for bugs like fearlessly with the attention. I mean, that that's that 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 makes their worlds bigger as well. I mean, that's what that was like when I was a kid, you know, my when I when I lay on my tummy in a meadow and looked into the grass stems and saw these tiny insects the size of like, you know, like full like punctuation marks and then turned up and looked at the sky and saw the kind of clouds overhead and, and really high up there were kind of birds and I realized that the scale of my house mm -hmm. domestic human scale was not the only scale right that the world became huge for me in that moment and I think that's something that's also uh, a really lovely thing it, it 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 centers a child's eye in a much bigger world than whatever their everyday world is absolutely it it helps a, it helps kids um, become like vespers. They get to reorient themselves and they get to figure out what's on the horizon is not just their house, you know, it's not just their parents even. There's other people who might have different viewpoints and yeah. you know, there's a whole world out there. Um, so be like a vesper. 
yeah go look <laughs> this has been so much fun i've had such a lovely time yeah, it has been fun i i was inspired this morning i saw a bald eagle i was out near a lake and so it was just a sign that we were going to have a, a wonderful wonderful event this evening so thank you both so much thank you. thank you to everyone and i hope next time i'll be able to see you all in person thank you for coming and thank you for this wonderful event everybody it's been great. Yes. Thank you. i'm just going to say a couple closing remarks and then we'll, we'll shut down but this has been wonderful um if you'd like to purchase helen and amy's books we have them here in the store or you can um click the button online or come to our website um we have lots of copies and uh, if you miss some of the conversation tonight, it will exist on the Crowdcast platform, so you can watch it later or share it with friends. Um, and you can find out about other events that we have upcoming on Crowdcast. But just thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Helen, for staying up late thank in England you. to talk with us. Great joy, thank you. And thanks for bringing me the storm too, Amy, that's coming in Mississippi. I know what that's like. Thank <laughs> you, yeah, it's thundering here. I was like, stop thundering just for two more minutes, you know? <laughs> so, thank you all, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank bye, you so much. Bye. And buy Best for Flights if you don't have it already. Buy it, buy it, buy it. It's published in paperback last week, Amy. Last week was a paperback here. Oh, OK, great, great. great. Um, and I just want to say support Flyleaf Books. Independent books are the lifeblood of all of our culture. So please, please support independent books. Um, thank you, Helen. It's been Thank so you. Great. Take care now. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.